All right. All right. I think we're going to move on to our next panel here, Beyond Ink and Paint, the Women of Animation. Let's we'll switch over views here. Welcome. Hello. Is that Matt, our friend Matt? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> Excellent. Nice to see you again since I was here last on Monday. But my other guests, I think, are first time coming into CTN in the virtual mode this year. Yeah. Um, but, but in any case, we're all excited to be here. So um, I guess what we'll do, we might as well just get going because I don't want to yeah. lose any time where we can have uh, questions at the end. So I guess I'll say, um, first of all, welcome. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, we really thought about the theme of the expo this year, the revive and thrive. And, and so that inspired us to speak to specifically the thrive part of it. So uh, this group of lovely ladies are going to talk about how interconnected women are in our industry and within studios. And we'll talk about things like mentorship and networking and generally just being supportive and positive good people helps us all thrive. So we're coming at it from that direction. I mean, especially in today's world, facing challenges and rising together is a hot topic with pandemic and all. So, so I'll start by introducing myself and then I'll let everybody else introduce themselves. Um, my name is Tracy Miller Zarnicki. I've been part of the animation industry for over two decades, starting in publicity and production management at Walt Disney Feature Animation. And uh, that was back, way back in the Emperor's New Groove and Chicken Little days. Some of you watching are probably too young to even remember those films. But uh, in the last 15 years, I've spent more time writing uh, books about the art of animation, the history of animation and the production of animation. Um, I also serve on the board for Women in Animation, which leads me into this whole discussion about being interconnected, uh, because that's how I met all the ladies here on this broadcast today. So um, what I will say, though, before we get started, we were having some technical difficulties with uh, Shannon, who is not here right now, but we're hoping she pops in at some point during our webinar. So don't be surprised if we get the addition of Shannon Pranowski here. Uh, she is, well, well, we'll explain how she's all connected as well. What I'm gonna do is start with passing the virtual baton to Chrissy Guest and let her talk about her being herself and how she's here today. Thanks, Tracy. So hello, uh, like Tracy said, I'm Chrissy Guest and I, um, I'm a filmmaker and I'm also an educator. Uh, and my role um, with this panel is to help discuss some of the things that I see as far as education and um, getting into the animation industry and then how to succeed once you're in the animation industry, uh, looking really um, at the um, context of women within the historical records and time frame and the way that we um, document women in animation. So I've been really fascinated by animation from a really young age. And I thought uh, I would love to um, uh, teach a course on women in animation and, uh, and then found challenges in that. And so uh, that led me to making a film, which led me to Tracy, which then led me to Yvette and led me to Sakari and to Shannon and to amazing women within this industry. And so from there, um, I feel really fortunate because that has uh, brought forward a lot of the history that I think we need to celebrate and need to talk more about. And so that is why I'm here and that is who I am. Awesome. Well, thank you, Chrissy. Um, so let's, uh, let's pass the virtual introduction baton to Yvette now. Tell us about yourself. Not that everybody doesn't already know who you are, but go ahead. Well, not everybody knows who I am. <laughs> but hi, um, I'm Yvette Kaplan. And since Tracy started with the decades, how long decades? I don't even, I'm double that, double that at least. And um, yeah, I started at a time when animation was at a down point, which is totally hard to imagine now. Um, so that, that, Revive is a big part of my career, I'd say. I feel like I'm constantly, I've been thriving, reviving, thriving, reviving. And, and the, it, Chrissy is completely right about the interconnectedness of so many of us. And um, it, it's amazing over the years to, to discover people again that are still, we're all still here. 
And I could talk about a connection with Shannon that she you, that you wouldn't even know. Um, um, but okay, you want to know about me? I I, mm-hmm. I started as an animator. I became a director um, early on in my career when animation started thriving again. And um, I've I've um, I've produced. I've I've created my own show, a preschool series. Um, the, the, but the main part of my career was directing on some luckily of luckily high profile successful shows that that I was happy and jo- and joyful every day to go to work um, to work with amazing teams um, uh, at, at MTV was my main my main time and that is where I met Shannon's a partner in crime Chris Pranowski and Shannon and both of them used to live in my I had a, get an apartment in my building and they were my tenants, Chris and Shannon. So how's that for interconnectedness? I, I yeah. love that. That is, that is so Shannon awesome. Is, Shannon is the goddess of animation and I, I hope she c- comes here, but but if, if not, she's very much in our hearts. Yes, we, we are all thankful for her presence here, which will yes. then lead me to Sakari. So Sakari, tell us about yourself and your connectedness in this whole thing. Hi, I'm Sakari Singh. Um, I moved here in 2011 and um, I started working at Titmouse on kind of like adult swim type shows. Worked way, my way up from being a designer to a storyboard artist. And uh, recently I've been working on like uh, shows like Big Mouth, Paradise PD, the new show Harper House for CBS All Access. Um, and I also was a co-producer for Titmouse's Pussy Straight. Uh, Pussy Strikes Back, The Art of Feminist Nerd Resistance, Um, (laughs) which I, uh, with uh, Melissa Lavingood and Jake G. Thompson, we collaborated with Shannon to put on this amazing uh, fundraiser art show. But it's just so interesting to hear everybody's stories and the interconnectedness, the the Thrive Revive, all that, because when I first moved to LA, I just feel the economy was like not so good. And I feel like I only really made it because of all the connections I made with women in animation. Shannon is one of the first friends that I made in the industry. And, you know, uh, shout out to her. <laughs> totally. You know, the other thing I want to mention, actually, well, I want you to mention, Sakari, is, is uh, what brought you out to LA in the first place? Let's, let's go back to that little tidbit story of the certain event that you were going to. I think you need to okay. tell that to this group. Okay, yeah. So I just graduated from the Kansas City Art Institute, went back to Minnesota, and I was like, I got to get to LA. I don't know anybody in the industry. I want to be in animation. And I found out about CPN, had some college friends that were going, and it's like, we're going to get an apartment, sleep on our couch, come to CPN. I was like, you got it. Bought a... Uh, two plane tickets and went to CTN and did not go back to Minnesota. Did not take that second plane ride because I'm like, I gotta, I gotta work in this industry. And then I started working at Titmouse because I met a ton of people from Titmouse and CTN. I love that story. I love that story. So awesome. Um, So we keep talking about Titmouse and that, that actually is, is part of what we're here to talk about because with all the interviews Chrissy was out there doing in the animation industry, she kept hearing like certain themes and you know certain certain good topics of conversation that kept coming up, and and so when she got to the Titmouse Studios, uh, she found that that studio and the women there, of which there were a lot, so thumbs up on that. Um, she found that the themes that were discussed there and and the experiences were vast enough that it kind of covered a lot of ground that, that she wanted to be sure to express in this documentary film. All right, Christy, I think I'm on that path. Um, so I think what we'll do now is take a moment and share like a five minute cut of what we consider the pilot of this docu-series. Um, and it's called The Women of Titmouse. It, it is shown in a few different festivals uh, already and a few other industry events, few educational events. So I would love Chrissy to, she's sharing now. So we're going to get to watch this and it gives you a sense of, you know, the experience of, of a variety of women in our industry who just happened to all be at Titmouse at this point in time. So 
I will be quiet and we shall watch this awesome about five minute piece. I really wanted to work in film. That was my big thing. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in film, but I wanted to just be able to have a voice in filmmaking. I'm Shannon Pranowski, and I am the co-owner of Titmouse, and I'm also the v vice president of Titmouse. I'm the supervising producer of Titmouse, and I do pretty much everything. <laughs> Well, there was a strong feeling of women in film in my, in my school. I went to School of Visual Arts. They really helped us. I mean, it was predominantly male. The teachers were all male. Um, but they really helped us. Like, they actually gave us, I got special grants for it. Um, but the challenge was, you are a woman, so you need to make something really special. Like, you can't just make a nor normal fit. Like, you kind of were on more of a spotlight. <laughs> the Kansas City Art Institute which is like a fine art school but their animation program was super new and um, so there's something about like 70s fine art like teachers that are super sexist like that kind of like black like I'm not saying all but like that kind of like black turtleneck like salt and pepper hair like they say some crazy stuff sometimes about women and art like it's like they're watching like a dog walk on their hind legs so there was a lot of that. First time I'd ever seen a nude model was like the first day of figure class, my freshman year of college. I didn't even know what a kneaded eraser was. People are just like giggling at my like lack of understanding. I'm just like, oh, there's a naked guy on the stand right now. Oh gosh, don't laugh. Oh, it's so intimidating when you haven't had that experience and you're just thrown into it. But it's wonderful once you do it and you, you just get so into just figuring out the body and the muscles and the structures and the, you know, the lighting. And then it, you just start breaking it down in your head and it's just, it's so much fun. But I never came from that. My parents, my mom was a dentist. My dad was an engineer. Like these were not acceptable paths to choose like as an artist. Establishing shot of Nick's home and he is super bummed. He is gonna walk towards the front door where Leah is just playing on a phone. There was a, a combo of can I actually do this? But that's at every process in the way from going to storyboard revisionist to storyboarders to like director. Because when you don't know much about the position, it's like, what does that even entail? Everybody who seems to be a director seems to know what they're always doing 100% of the time. And like aggressive and knows what they want. And I'll have to personally say I don't actually feel like that about myself. So you have to gain the confidence to, to bring your vision to life. The animation industry is relatively small. I mean, it's certainly growing, I think, especially digitally now with, you know, so much access to everything that you know, we're starting to see so many more women and girls like expressing an interest and being able to showcase their work online and things like that. Although I will say that there tend to be more women in like producer type roles, I find, and I'm hoping that continues to be the case, but I also hope that we see more women artists that are being hired and, and promoted within that community. But you're going to leave. You'll have to live for an episode by the time you're done. We will have hopefully delivered at least two. Oh. Shannon here at Titmouse has been really great to work with. You know, Titmouse's story in general, I think, is pretty great because they kind of started from this small t-shirt <laughs> company, essentially, um, and has now grown and keeps growing. And as the, you know, co-owner of the studio, I mean, she has to make a lot of decisions and keep the welfare and well-being of the studio um, you know, always intact. We have a LA, New York, and now we have Vancouver. We've got an overhead of like 20, which is producers and accountants and coordinators, about like 20% maybe, 25%. And the rest are all artists, 75% are like artists. 
at Titmouse, it kind of feels more equal, you know, which is really nice. You know, I've never felt so far. This is this is the only place I've worked so far, but I've I've never felt, you know, uh, this is weird. I'm a woman, and this is a man's world. I haven't felt like that here, you know. But my career is just beginning, so who knows what I'm going to meet down the line. Excellent. Some familiar faces in there. Um, so yeah, I, what I love about that piece, and, and, and it is longer. What's the running time on it, Chrissy? 20? 20, 26. 26 minutes. So. Normal episode, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it, it covers such a range. Even in that short piece, you could see from Heather, who's in her first job, you know, all the way up to Shannon, who owns the studio. You know, it's like, there's such a range of experience to learn from. And I think that's part of what we think is amazing that, that you know, I don't know. Every, people don't have to be women to be giving people, but I feel like women go other way to be nurturing and, 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 and good mentors. And, and, you know, you really captured a lot of, of that in that studio. So it's, it's great and inspiring and, and we're happy to, to keep expanding on that theme here. So, what I want to talk about, since I know a lot of our audience here at CTN are, are students, let's talk about um, educational paths. So let's start all the way back then. Um, maybe it's something, well, I think, Sakari, you, you've already alluded to it a little. Is there more you want to add on to your, your pathway from, from the education point? And, and then we may as well, while you're chatting, take it all the way into like landing that first job. Let's, let's hear about that segment. Uh, well, yeah, so I went to the Kansas City Art Institute, uh, which is a fine art school in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, with like a, it had a very new animation department, like maybe three years old at that point, uh, which I kind of liked because then I could kind of um, talk people into giving me the education that I wanted, you know, like I would write like letters to the head of the uh, department arguing like why should we should be studying this subject or this subject. And uh, once I graduated, um, I really just had to band together with all of my close friends that I had made in the department because we were all from the Midwest and we're like, we're going to LA. We got to just all shove into like a two bedroom apartment, get some jobs at Forever 21 or reality show or whatever, and like figure it out. That's, that's how we were able to financially, you know, have that freedom uh, which was a little rough. I mean, there used to be so many people in this apartment, it was out of control. Um, <laughs> but eventually, I, you know, I, I went to CTN, I ended up going to my first uh, Titmouse Smash party, I think that weekend, they usually kind of line up. Um, I didn't know anybody, but I talked to everybody I could get a hold of. And I took a few tests at Titmouse for animation, actually. Um, and it just got to the point where they needed someone right away and they contacted me and I was in and that's kind of all I needed to get going. That's so awesome. And actually, Christy, maybe you could speak to the education part of this for a minute. Just just because I might come back to you, Yvette, though, in a sec, too, to talk about your first job in animation. I, I, I know we... We may not have covered that in our pre-discussion, but I, I want to hear that part of, of your life too. But Christy, let's let's stay on the education bit for a minute. Let's talk about that. I went to school too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, and one of the things that, one of the themes that we discovered in, in talking with women in animation and then also looking at the research that was available when we started the project and then now it's even more, uh, more robust, but um you know, seeing this gap in, in education as far as um, the amount of women that are graduating from art schools uh, with those degrees and then not obtaining work within the industry was really concerning. And as an educator, um, I am a professor at Ithaca College. I, I really wanted to examine why that was happening. I thought that was really important to see what, what's happening in, in the span of, um, uh, you know, four-year program or two-year program, what's, what's, what makes someone so passionate about something get discouraged or what, what alters their path? And so that was also part of the, part of this um, journey is to discover what can help students be successful and what needs to happen and in, in, in the educational programs to make that happen 
uh, in particular for women and, and marginalized people, because I feel like that is really the only way we're going to have the stories that everyone wants to hear, where we have stories of representation that everyone wants to hear and so and enjoy and, and see in our art. Um, so I, I take that really personally, my educational path, um, very much like the gap that I saw in the animation industry. I had a really great uh, mentor um, uh, early on and in high school who encouraged me to go into television and I did and I, I, I still to this day um, sent her a card and, and those things, you know. Um, and then when I got to, to college, I, I experienced, a, I would say a horrific professor. Um, and so someone who did not encourage, encourage or uh, acknowledge um, uh, my voice as a, as a creative person. And so now as a teacher, I look at that and say, I will never be that person. So I learned from both. That's why I'm telling the story. I learned lessons from both of those people. I learned from the mentor, how to be that type of mentor um, and have that example. And I learned from the person that I thought did, did a lot of damage, um, what not to do. And so I think that that's also part of this. this. This film and this project is about showing examples of the people we want to inspire us and that we want to be, um, uh, you know, our role models. And, and we, we need to see that in our history because it's there. It just has to be, it just has to be pulled out and brought to the forefront so that every woman knows that there is, there is someone like them uh, who's done it and done it well and, and they can and be inspired by that. Yeah, and that leads me as a great segue into someone who's done it well, talking to you, Yvette. Um, so ta tell, us, tell us about, you know, just your, the bit from your, your education step into the career world. Like what was, what was that like? And, and you know, how, how do you use that helping others, you know, in, in a mentor kind of way nowadays? It's a lot in there. Um, I know, I know. You can just feel your way through whatever, you know, you, you want to do with that. I, I decided at five years old, I was going to be an animator. I don't think I ever knew what, anima what an animator really did. I just loved to draw characters. So I must have seen it on TV. Animators do that. So that was it. And, and as I mentioned in my intro, animation was so nothing in those days, it was a real down period that there weren't any animation majors. Now we've got hundreds of schools to choose from. Every day there's a new one with an animation program, but there weren't any um, that I, well, there weren't any that had a major. Um, and I couldn't even find a school that, that offered animation. And in fact, I was registered, I was, I had applied for the only other school I knew. I grew up in a very provincial little neighborhood in Brooklyn and, and when it was provincial, <laughs> not hip. And um, uh, I was going to go to the uh, FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology, and do fashion illustration because uh, I used to draw all my characters with great little clothes. So that was another thing I liked. And then luckily, an, an art teacher in my high school uh, told me that I have to go to this. We're having um, teachers from art schools coming, uh, prof, uh, administration from, not from, yeah, from art schools, could, yeah, uh, that it was for especially for art um, to come and speak. And, and, and there was David Rhodes from the School of Visual Arts, and he mentioned that they have animation classes. And that was that. I applied and I got a scholarship. And um, that was the start. I, uh, but, but there was no major animation. I had, I was a media major, which meant I had to take advertising classes and everything. And, but, it, but they, they knew how much it meant to me. And so many teachers just let me make my films as, as a part of it. So I, I, I had wonderful instructors. It's hard to believe that, that there wasn't an animation major. In fact, that, that year was the last year that that happened the next year because there were there were few of us and and a few of us who are who have been working in the industry all this time um they they made it and they made a major in animation and uh, i eventually taught at the school also but um let, since there was such a small little industry i i started working for my instructors who were all working 
animation artists, I started working while I was still in school. Um, so I had opportunities that were really amazing that I didn't even realize were amazing until you know later. Um, so I, 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 I started animating commercials while I was still a student. And um, I, I actually uh, worked at my at my, I, my my idol's studio, my favorite, John Hubley. If anyone out there doesn't know the Hubley films, please watch them because they're the most inspiring things you'll ever see. And and I I was a messenger. <laughs> I was 17 years old, and I was the worst messenger on earth. But because I, I used to stand in the art department and say. Oh, can I draw? Can I draw? I just kept kept wanting to work, and, and you know, but 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 I I had my my jobs to do, um, but I met a lot of amazing people at that little studio, and um, I didn't last long because I was a terrible messenger, and um, I just I just was lucky. There were so few animators, and I, I got to say I, I probably I, I I never really felt um, like a like like. An, a, a woman and like a female animator, like an oddball, because there were so few of us at the time um, that I was, it was odd to be an animator. That was odd enough. I only, it was only later as I became more successful that, that it started to become evident that this is, you know, I'm, it is unusual and it's not so easy. I, I, I had, so I kind of lived my career in reverse. But as far as a bad teacher, a really destructive teacher, Chrissy, I, I was at a comic, comics class at SVA that the instructor who was very well known and very well respected, um, there were three women and he called us the three witches. And he paid no attention to us whatsoever. Charming. So uh, I guess it's amazing him. that we survived. Yeah, yeah I, I guess you showed him at this point. Oh my gosh. He, he, he didn't never paid attention. He didn't, wouldn't have known. <laughs> He's wow. now, so, you know. Well, all right, well, let's, let's clear your brain of, <laughs> of a bad experience, but tell us, tell us about um, a mentor in your life that, that okay. you, you've had. Let's, let's switch into a positive influence. But this is an extremely positive. Um, and it's the most, most um, amazing person I've ever known. Um, uh, it is a man, uh, a male named Tony Eastman who I um, actually met at my very first full-time job after I was out of school. And um, he, he, was, he was not working in the animation department, oddly enough, he was working in motion graphics um, and commercials, live act, I don't know, other stuff, but we, we met and he was an, a brilliant animator who turns out was animating, knew everyone and animating for everyone that there could be, but the most, unassuming, modest uh, guy who, my, I, I've said it many times that I owe my entire career to him because he, anything that he, he'd get called for everything because he was so good. Everything that anyone had, they'd call Tony. And if Tony couldn't do it, he'd call me and ask me if I could do it or he'd tell them, give them my name. And I swear that the hot, the biggest things in my career, that's how I, 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 I was, I started as an animator on the Doug pilot, the pilot for Nickelodeon's Doug, Tony directed the pilot. So I was an animator working for Tony in that way. Later on, he was called to work on the magic school bus and he couldn't do it. And he recommended me and I became a consultant on the magic school bus. He was boarding on a new show for MTV called Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> That to me looked like, oh my God, how could he do that? And then uh, they needed a director. He recommended me, and that was before it was even on the air. And and uh, and that was my that became my greatest achievement. Really, I I, uh, I was supervising director on Beavis and Butthead. Um, but Tony continued to do boards. Tony boarded my favorite episodes that I directed. Tony. Um, Tony then, oh, I, I animated on uh, Richard Scary thing that he produced. Then before I left New York um, for LA, he and I produced, d produced six shorts for Between the Lions, an educational show. I, we, we split them, we, we designed, 
boarded and directed um, six shorts. So I, I always wondered if I didn't leave New York, would we have done more together? And um, I mainly speak about Tony now because he just passed away. And it's a loss for everyone. You're going to hear that Tony Eastman was responsible for so many careers. I thought he was my personal fairy godfather, but he was he 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 is responsible for so many people. You said that I'm responsible. So maybe that's uh, you know I have the chills just thinking about it because I, I I haven't come close to what Tony did for me. But I'm 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 honored. I'm I'm so honored when I hear a young person say. I mean, God, weirdly enough, Chris, Chris, Chris Pernowski says it because he was my, he was a board artist at MTV when I was the supervising director. So, you know, uh, he, they, they, my, 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 my students have surpassed me and, and it's a pleasure to see them, um, to see them do that. Well, so, uh, it, it sounds like you've more than paid forward the the legacy really that Tony left with you. Like I, I feel like I feel and, and you know I I could be with you anywhere and somebody comes up and is like oh my god I love you you did this for me like I, I feel like you definitely are a naturally giving person but but the fact that you can attest how strong mentorship led into your amazing career. I mean, that, that is the ultimate testament right there. That is really what, what we hope mentorship and, and being connected and being caring and sharing does. So thank you so you are, much. You are absolutely perpetuating that, what that, Tony did. Not, not an ounce of co co competitiveness. See, we find that a lot, a lot of the worst things in studio is, you know, the trying to succeed and in order to succeed, somebody else has to you know, kind of not succeed. And then, and, and, and we tend to get competitive with each other. I had that experience a lot too. Um, when I discovered that from other people, that, 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 that other people were feeling competitive to me, I couldn't believe it. But Tony never, not an, not an ounce. He, that's how confident he was in his abilities or how he, he just, he just loved what he did. And that was it. He didn't get into the politics of things. He, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah, I think that, that's strong. That, that speaks strongly to the person who, who doesn't need to compete with everybody. They just stand on their own ground and support others knowing that, I mean, I'm a firm believer in putting positive energy out there just creates more positive energy and it comes back to you. So we have to, we, you know? have, to, we have to respect and, and praise each other, especially yeah. in animation because it's such a team team uh, thing and absolutely yeah you know, I think you always do the right thing uh, when I was in charge I didn't always you know sometimes I would forget I and mean we're human right those that, are things I regret the most those that happens that happens but I feel like you being a supportive person and, and you know being a supportive person in general is is huge and and I wanted to ask you guys um what are some other kinds of supports that do you think have been helpful in the industry? Besides, if you don't have a specific direct mentorship kind of situation, are there, are there other supports in the industry? Like, I, like I'll, I'll just mention Women in Animation as an organization is an amazing support base. Um, Sakari, I want to talk to you about that a bit. Like, what, what do you see as supportive in this industry? Honestly, it's always been pretty easy for me to find like a very sweet, supportive and like people in animation, especially women. And maybe that's because I started at Titmouse. Um, but my strategy has uh, always been like, I'm, I always go for shows and creators that I'm like a huge fan of. Like you don't always get that privilege. Sometimes you, you gotta work or whatever. But whenever I've worked on something that I really admire, I try to, you know, express that to the person. And usually that has really helped me in like growing and having them be a little more open to mentoring me and let me like me letting them know that I'm open to that. Um, I feel that way about Brad Neely. Um, I, my first real animation job was on his show for Adult Swim. And then he brought me on to um, his sketch comedy show, which was Hard Nolan Slopio PPO. That was the name of it. Um, <laughs> but the way it was structured, he would just kind of like have post it. A lot of it was just like ideas that he had that maybe he hadn't quite fleshed out or like he's like, I need something else for it. And he would kind of throw it to whatever board artist he thought could like 
make a better joke. So that was just like a great experience for me. It built a lot of confidence in my own voice, you know. Um, and it's just important to be really open to friendship, just period, in the industry. Like everyone is so interesting. And I feel like if you just go about with that attitude, you will make connections really fast, you know? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, Chrissy, did you have other, I, I think we want to talk to you too about like other other resources and, and, and support positive things in the industry. Yeah, there's, um, there's a there's there's a couple of different organizations obviously ctn holding an event like this is really powerful for for anyone wanting to get into the industry or or is currently in the industry and looking to grow even more this is this is an uh, amazing event um but i would agree uh you know um a couple of things that sakari has said and and yvette has have talked about is the friendships you know it's sakari coming out to LA with a group of friends and having that support system it you know mentorship doesn't have to be it comes in different in different ways and I think that a lot of times people need to think about the fact that you want a, a, a lot of different mentors and they don't always they don't always always have to be um, older than you I think that's also uh, and I the people tend to think oh it has to be someone who's older than me it doesn't have to be or, or has worked longer than me it could be someone who's just mentoring you and just how to balance things that you're trying to figure out in the world. But um, I, I know that the other organizations, uh, uh, WIA, as you, Tracy already mentioned, uh, Women in Animation, but uh, the Society of Animation Screen Studies is another one, especially for people who are interested in diving into the history and then, and also, um, you know, uh, examining critically how animation impacts our society. I think that the Society of uh, Animation Screen Studies is a great one. And then another one that I, um, I support as an educator is the University of Film and Video Association also has a law, uh, uh, has just started its own animation caucus and, and educators are going there to really dive into ways to better impact uh, animation uh, education. Uh, in colleges. So I think those are, those are three that I would, I would definitely recommend. That's great. That's all good stuff to uh, share with our audience today. Um, so you really need support in moments that are super challenging, right? I mean, support's great all the time, but, but I want to throw this one to Yvette because as you mentioned before, you know, the career can be like this. Oh, so talk to us about, just give us one challenging scenario that you you got through and tell us how you got through it you know i have i mean there's endless ones to choose from but i know you have a plethora of amazing stories two, but you want I, one that's more personal in nature or more you know, career career I, like there's because like probably hmm. career just because of who's listening today but i mean whatever right so okay, the challenge well, is huge it's, it's true it's true well either way it's with because life happens, life happens. And, and I've had that where everything in life happened, yet I had to get through uh, a, a challenging uh, project. And I managed to do it with, without anyone knowing uh, that I was going through um, everything, moving, loss. So it's right after, right after uh, Beavis, but it ended for me right after MTV. Uh, I had, had a, a clean out my office after seven years of, you know, I think I say seven, it might not have been seven, but that's what it felt like. And my, 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 my marriage ended, my, my father was in the hospital, it was like everything. And, but so that was a challenging thing getting through the, the working with the creators and not letting them, I was a supervising producer on a project. So I had to keep all these balls rolling. Um, um, but it led me to the career challenge, most career challenging moment, which I thought was, oh my God, the best thing that could ever happen to me. I, I was asked to be head of story on, on the movie Ice Age. Um, so it was my transition from a career in TV to feature. Um, and, and, and for all of you out there who maybe don't know which way you wanna go, 
um, it, th for, things are things are a little different now, and there really is some more crossover. People go from TV and feature and TV because some of the best things being made are on TV and with streaming. You are thinking of long arcs, but in that day, um, it was very different. Uh, episodes in TV were standalone, and a feature was you know, a long, drawn out thing. Um, and deadlines are very, very different. So I was used to making decisions on a quick, quickly on, uh, on, um, on, on a, when I had a project, when I had a, a, something to be decided. I, I was very, I, I had a lot of ideas that were quick and I thought as head of story, that would be the perfect thing, you know, that I would, this is the way we do it. But I discovered that no, it's, um, it doesn't matter what how how great you your idea is it's try it again this way try it again that way try it again maybe we do it this way and i so i was like going out of my mind um with how long things were taking i, I and how 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 little you know how little impact it seemed one could make you know whereas in tv it's very quick and, and you gotta, you gotta have an answer. And if it's not perfect, let it, let it go, but feature. And that's, that's the joy. That's the joy too, for people who are, who are, uh, who do that well, um, to just keep pushing. You know, you always say when you, when, when something comes back a TV thing, you say, if only I had the time. Well, <laughs> I had the time in feature, but it wasn't fun for me. It wasn't fun because, um, I felt like nothing was happening. It took so long, and, and but finally, finally, amazingly, the thing gets done, and it's wonderful. And it's like, how did that happen? Um, I, I I used to say I I figured it out in six months, but I had to sit there for three years till till it got in there, you know. And um, that's a feature for you, right? So basically, I guess I I my way of getting through it was not getting through it. Unfortunately, I I I went back to TV afterwards. I didn't want to work in feature, so I spent a lot of years regretting that <laughs> because I loved I loved working on on uh, you know I, I I did I did I did learn that I could see from beginning to end and, and, and where an audience needed to be led. So it's, it's a thrilling thing, but you know, I, 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 um, I, I needed, uh, I needed a little quicker pace. So it was frustrating. It was a, it was a frustrating time and, and not knowing quite where to go afterwards, you know, like, like not knowing where I belonged. Yeah, it's 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 oh, gotta I be challenging. Something else, you know, created yeah, my yeah. own show. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say every every step on the path leads to somewhere, right? And you just have to trust that that even if that path's a little bumpy, it's taking you to where you're supposed to be, right? Yeah. I mean, but I have to say, like Sakari, being a story artist too. I mean, you got to get used to like your stuff. You're working, 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 it gets thrown out. I mean, in TV, you probably don't have the the long, painful thing that the vet was talking about in feature. But I know having run the story room as a production management person for two films, well, multiple films, but two that actually got to the screen. There's a lot of your work that gets thrown out. That's just how it is. And you've got to keep grinding and grinding and grinding. And you got to have patience to work through, you know, some of those scenes time and time again. But Sakari, do you want to speak to the story life just for a moment to, you know, what that's like and Oh, just the, the grind. The, the, challenge, <laughs> the, the challenge of that, I guess. We'll keep the challenge theme focused. Um, okay, this, I, I feel like before this year, I would have like a different answer for this, but working in quarantine and also work, like I got my first um, assistant directing jo uh, job this year, and it was right at, in March when uh, quarantine happened. So my first directing job, I was directing from my couch back there because uh, I hadn't quite figured out my equipment. And then also the uh, Black Lives Matter movement was happening. I'm from Minneapolis. My sister was right in the middle of the city, right in the middle of it. And so that was probably the most challenging for me, but I'm kind of glad that it, uh, it happened at a time where mentally I was like the most challenged and it was fine. I figured it out. I could still communicate with people. 
every uh, everyone was pretty honest and raw about how where they were uh, mentally at that time. So I felt like that was um, kind of a good way to to start learning how to communicate with a crew uh, digitally, like you know through Zoom, through chat, and all that kind of thing. Um, and also like learning how to process my own feelings about race and like how I am treated in the industry while kind of getting this like really new, exciting opportunity. Uh, it was a lot for me to deal with, but I feel like I made it to the other side of it and I feel even more confident. Um, and I also feel better being able to more freely talk about what it's like to be a woman of color in animation, you know? Um, I've gotten a lot of random um, DMs and messages from like students that are women of color that have messaged me and they're like, I can't believe you work in animation. I've never seen anyone that looks like you work in animation. And I was like, I didn't even think about how much that would mean to people. Um, but it's true, you know, uh, I feel like I constantly kind of have to put myself out there as, you know, as a woman, because Sometimes people look at you and they just don't think you look like a manager. You look like someone that should be in charge. And I feel that doubly goes for women of color. So it means a lot to me that uh, students have reached out to me and said that because for me, it's just like my own ambition and struggle and joy to work in animation. So that's what I have been thinking about with uh, struggles in animation this year. <laughs> Well, yeah, this year for sure. But I mean, you know, amazing how the whole, if you can see it, you can be it makes a difference, right? Like, I mean, that is a thing. Like, you, you know, Yvette, when you were coming up in the ranks, you said there were a few animators, but there were even fewer women doing it. So like, you've been that for people, Yvette, and Sakari, you are embracing that now. And again, like this whole leading by example and, and bringing people up with you, like that is so important in our industry, I think, you know, the animation is meant to entertain, inform, engage, you know, good stuff, right? So you guys are, you guys are living it. And that's awesome. And well, I'm, I'm just glad you're sharing that with us here. Um, I'm going to skip around our questions a little bit, because I'm looking at the time and I'm going, oh, we're running out of time. So let me just ask, let's continue a little tiny bit on, on maybe Sakari, you could just share with us or, well, this, actually, I'm going to throw this one to Chrissy. Um, talking about the balance between work and life right now, because I know you're also a parent, you're a filmmaker, you're a professor, you're wearing a lot of hats. So just in these pandemic times, so we heard, we heard from Sakari, like what that's been like in her working world, but Chrissy, wearing all those different hats, give us a minute just about finding the balance between work and life. And now that you've got environments where they're melded together, your work and your life space are all the same. How, how, how do you do this? Yeah, that is a excellent question. I think we're all still trying to, to navigate it and figure it out. And, uh, and I, I know that I'm, uh, uh, I'm struggling with it as an educator. It takes five times longer to do things, um, uh, to keep your classes engaged and to, to check in with your students and their mental health and, and make sure they're doing okay with the, the pandemic. And as, Sakari said with Black Lives Matter, I mean, we, we do mental check-ins. How is everyone? How is everyone doing? And then, and then um, remote access. Uh, I, I sit in a room with computers that are moving on their own and I'm teaching and there's no one there. It's, it gets to you after a while because um, it's very sad. I want my students in the classroom. I want them there. I don't, I, I love at least, you know, to see, see activity in the room, but it's, it's depressing after a while. So I think it's really difficult. And then you're in these Zoom environments. I mean, this is, you know, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. And after a while, you just, um, you know, you do dogs barking, you're trying to have a meeting about things. And I think it's, uh, it's really, um, uh, it's really, it's challenging. It's really challenging. And then just balancing life. And before the pandemic, it was, it was difficult to balance, you know, it was difficult to balance. And I know that in our interviews, you know, Tracy and I both, we've, we've discussed the fact that balancing for women in, in animation is very difficult. And it's difficult, I think, 
uh, in this country, when we look at daycare, we look at just even mental health breaks and, and the way studios are structured. And it's one of the things that I, one of the reasons I concentrated on Titmouse and um, another studio that uh, we, we went and, and did interviews at Leica, um, the unique things that people are trying to give people balance, you know, the ability to go into work and then, um, you know, take breaks and, and, and look at, and look and understand that life actually happens um, beyond the, uh, the studio walls, I think is really important. And so, um, yeah, it's hard to balance it all. I'm still trying to figure it all out. Uh, but I know that I think the best thing we can do is check in and know that um, we're supporting each other and, and making sure that people understand that there are gonna be days where you can't produce good work if you're under that kind of stress. And um, I think that's what's the most important thing, at least what I'm doing in my classroom is stepping back and saying, you know what guys, let's just slow down a little. I think we're trying, let's just slow down and like, like, like take a moment and just see how everybody is with all of this um, and, and go from there. And I think that's the most important thing we can do is just remember we're all human. That's an excellent point. Yeah. And, and I like, I like you touched upon it and I think Sakari might have something to add to this. Uh, like they're doing something beyond just animation or your career, right? You got to have like, your brain has to go somewhere else for a bit. So Sakari, give us, give us some thoughts on that. Cause I, I think you had something to share. Um, I've always been um, pretty good at uh, having a life outside of animation work. Um, partly because I think I moved to LA and I was just so excited to be around like so many artists. I love film, you know, I used to, I would like go to comedy shows after work every week and just meet as many people as I can. Um, but yeah, especially during uh, 2020, it's pretty important to be able to uh, give your brain and your, your wrists and your muscle memory a little bit of a break during this time. Um, so I've, you know, I've uh, been painting cow prints on pretty much everything in my apartment. Uh <laughs> nice. Is that, is that what we see behind you there in your yeah. frame? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, we have a, a few examples of that. But um, yeah, it's important to not put all of your, uh, your self-worth into like how stressed out you're making yourself about your work. You know, there is, there are moments you can take for yourself to, to stabilize. And that is also important to your work. It will make your work better and more interesting. Yeah, that's a valuable thing. That, that just realizing that the more well-rounded you are as a person, the more you bring to the table anywhere, right? So I think that's, and, that's um, Even this year before the, uh, the lockdown started, I was at uh, Sundance at uh, Slam Dance actually because I was a makeup artist on um, a short uh, web series that was screening there. So I, it's still important to you know put your work out in in other forms. You know I love animation; it is my career, and I feel like working on these other projects always helped me. It helps me be more excited about like the professional work that I'm doing. That's great. Yeah, I feel like it keeps you thriving, you know, in the big picture, which which helps everything you're doing. So that's great. Well, uh, I'm watching the clock. So I, I, I know we could go on all day. But um, what we want to show the audience is a little preview of these other amazing women in our industry that Chrissy has captured on film. Well, some of them, they're not all in this short trailer we're going to see here. But but there there's such a, a wealth of wisdom and experience that Chrissy's gathered. Um, we want to show you just a little clip of that. And, you know, we'll see, we'll see some of that in there too, I think. So um, let's watch that for two minutes plus, just a little bit. No, the history of, the history of animation is, it's all guys writing about it. Like who would have ever thought that, you know, that if they saw me, that I would be directing me. It was a butt you know? I went to school going, I am going to be an animator. You know, getting into animation was the ability to act with a pencil. It's been a long journey to get to this place. You start off. Uh, 
I got into the animation industry. I got interested in it during the dark days, and uh, that would be the mid 80s. And this is an original layout from the Doug Pilot that started everything. I thought, well, why not start a women in animation group? So literally, I sent out about 50 faxes, faxes. Mm -hmm. There's still a huge uh, gap between, um, you know, female directors, female animators, and uh, female characters represented on screen. These are very rough. They're very, like, quick drawings. Um, this is their three-week pitch. I guess I don't look up to many women because there haven't been many women in higher positions. And I'm sure there's one. I, I just can't think of it right now. I'm one of the first women producers probably not in animation history, but in the computer animation industry. It's hard getting into the business. It's hard starting out. It's hard trying to keep your artistic integrity. They didn't want me to talk at the Oscars, but there was no way I was not going to go up there and say, this was about my, <laughs> my daughter inspired this. <laughs> we're still uncomfortable with, we're still uncomfortable with female voices. Oh, those things? I turned them off because they made my house. Even the way that we learn animation is scripted with gender bias. What Women in Animation is like trying to get studios to do is to, you know, notice, like, do you have any women in your studio? Thank you for sharing that. Um, lovely to see some some amazing women in that, and and that's just a small amount of what you've gathered in in this series. And and I will say, uh, we we don't have an air date yet because we haven't figured out the proper distribution partner yet. So that is in the works, uh, but we will get these stories out here. We're we're also talking about um, a book form. We're talking about, you know, having all this material archived so that it can be shared here to forth beyond even our existence. Um, so, so, you know, again, going back to the whole, we're all connected here. Uh, I'm grateful to be connected to you ladies and, and to, to help bring these stories to light through this series. And, and I, I must say that, um, I've learned so much just listening to those stories in the series and, and of course you ladies today in person, live and in person. Um, so I think we've got a few minutes left. Let's ask our friend Matt, the host, what's going on in Q&A world and see if he has anything to share. Yeah, I think I might jump into this first question here that's asking, uh, what are your best solutions to imposter syndrome as a woman? So that's fair game, any of y'all. Go for it. Um, I could go because um, I mean, I feel like this happens to me a lot as like a woman of color. Um, I, I recommend listening uh, to a lot of Megan the Stallion. Um, I, I feel like that I need to hype myself up a lot with like uh, female role models in all areas of my life. Um, because it, it, it kind of sneaks up on you, the imposter syndrome. Like all of a sudden you're sitting in a room and you're like, am I full of, full of it? And no, <laughs> you've got to, you've got to just like have mantras for yourself to, to ground you in, in reality, basically. It's kind of like um, you're, you're gaslighting yourself a little bit. So that's my advice. Well, that's a good way to put it, Sakari. Yeah. All right, shall we see another question? Hear another question rather? Yeah, okay, so uh, another question is asking um, if any of you guys have like any social media or LinkedIn that they can reach out to you, inquire more about, you know, maybe uh, just make connections for other, for other uh, female artists. Uh, well, you can find me on uh, social media at Sakari Singh, S-A-K-A-R-I, last name Singh, S-I-N-G-H. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, you know. <laughs> She's all out there. That's awesome. I'm on LinkedIn and um, I just I just made a website. <laughs> cool. I, I didn't know that. I'm going to go, I'm gonna so check that out. 
it was only in uh, in construction for for uh, eight years, twelve years. Um, but now <laughs> I have a new. I went to another. So I actually did it, but 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 in, in a recreation, recreating myself in a little way, because uh, awesome. now, now I'm now I'm I want to write. <laughs> so great. Well, good things come to those who wait, right? So eight years is worth the wait. I've been writing my whole, you know, as a director forever, and now, now I'm fessing up. So we'll see. So it's it's a secret website. Nobody oh. knows it yet. But, okay. You know. But you're on LinkedIn. You're on LinkedIn. That's not secret. On LinkedIn. Well, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn too. That's the easiest way to find me. So yeah. And um, and Beyond Ink and Paint. Uh, has a website and all of our social media is on there and we would love for you to cut you can see the trailer again on uh, on the site and um, you can follow us for updates and and we also have the women of titmouse we have at least um, the trailer for that as well um, but it would be great to have all everyone follow us there and I do have a LinkedIn just Chrissy guest and I'm happy to uh, to link in with people as well yeah uh, shout out to our other producer, Leanne Batar, who just put the beyondingypaint.com in the chat. So yeah, that's there. Awesome. So good. All right. Another question, Matt? Yeah. Okay. So we're getting a question from someone who's going to a school that's not a traditional art school. It's got a new, a new program. And they're worried that they're going to fall behind compared to um, their peers from other schools. What should they focus on learning as a student so that they're ready by the time they are ready to enter the industry. Um, I could uh, jump into that because um, I went to a fine art school that wasn't necessarily known for animation. Um, and I think you should focus on making a film, like on getting a single vision of yours from beginning to end conceptually. And I think that, um, that really helped me in figuring out what part of the industry I was even interested in working in. Yeah, so that's so my many, big advice. No, that's <laughs> great. There are so many jobs in animation. People don't even know that they exist. That's part of what we discovered, I think, in, in doing this documentary. It was like, there are so many different jobs that we should talk about and share with people so they know they have options. I mean, Yvette, do you have any, any other suggestions for folks? Yeah, it's funny because I have, uh, I, as an instructor, uh, when I was teaching um, animation in the School of Visual Arts, I, I, I didn't really believe that um, every, every student should make a film um, because there are so many. Now, now, if you have a voice, if you have a story to tell and you know you have a story to tell, obviously, Zakara, you did. <laughs> and, and for those that do, it's that it, I agree. Get you know it's so easy now. You have the, the tools. You don't have to. You don't have to. You know, hand draw and have something shot and not see it for for a month like the way we used to. Just just do it. Um, do start with you know do a little script, make a, a storyboard, and just animate, animate, draw, draw, draw. But but the but but if you don't have those, uh, if you're not an idea person and you're an artist, there's so many, if, you, 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 if you're a character designer, draw, draw characters. If you're a background designer, painter, a color person, there's so many ways, just, just, just look online, look at people that you admire, look at portfolios, um, go, to, go to networking places, watch films, just see what 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 you're drawn to, because there and and in, in CG there are so many roles. There's lighting people. There's there's texture people. There's so many specialties. Um, like 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 Christy said, there's so many jobs and so many shows being done. Only one person. Uh, there's only only one person is going to be the creator, and only a handful of people are going to be the director, and then. Only another handful are going to be the storyboard artists, but there are so many other things. And, and you can have that goal to be the director or be, create your own show, but, um, but just, just, just up your skills. You have a sketchbook and just, just listen to people. Do come to CTN, uh, watch workshops. Um, there's so, and there's so many uh, um, 
what is it, uh, two, two tutorials online, you know, you could, there's so much available. And through this pandemic, I mean, it's been so inspiring. I've been watching things that I never, listening to people speak who I never would have had the opportunity to or the time to. So take advantage of this time now and just continue what you're doing. You're here. So you're already, you've already started. That's great advice. All right. Well, thank you. I don't know if we have time for one more or if we're, if we're out. Matt, you tell us. Hey, we'll just uh, do one last question. We just got a new one in here. That's uh, when developing animation skills, do you recommend project-based learning or doing lots of tests? Do you like maybe taking a project to completion, I think maybe is what they're asking, like an animated short? I mean, I would say short, like, <laughs> um, just because like uh, you, you have a little bit more freedom on what you would want to focus on, you know? Um, and testing uh, can be hit or miss as far as like your growth, I feel like. It feels like um, uh, more, more uh, predatory than uh, I think is necessary. <laughs> for you to improve yourself. I would say, uh, even if you, you think that you need those kind of like strict parameters to make yourself really hunker down and like push yourself, I would encourage you to create those exercises by yourself or maybe with some peers. Um, I know at Titmouse, we did a few, um, all, we did a, a few um, uh, women led zines and like projects with deadlines kind of just for fun and to push ourselves and to kind of like showcase our skills like in the company a bit more. So uh, it can be fun and also really push yourself as an artist to come up with those activities with your community. That's great. And any last yeah. thoughts on that, Yvette? Yeah, I, I just like that, it, that Sakari's right. I, I it, The way things are now, one thing about making a short is that everyone who watches it will see who you are as an artist. It's hard tests, te you know, tests are great if you actually get the job from the test, but, but way too often they just pile up and no one even sees them. I mean, that's the sad truth. In fact, the animation guild and the animation union are trying to have studios do away with testing especially for people who are already in the industry. For someone who's starting out, yes, occasionally there's, they find, we've, people find a brilliant new artist um, and it's great. So, so don't avoid them if you're new, you know, do everything you can. But, um, but, but, but when, you have, when you have a film or a reel, you know, a reel of animation, you don't, it doesn't have to be a film. See, that's, the, that's what I wanted my students to do. Just if they were great animators, just animate an action, you know, animate something, animate two characters interacting, animate something or board something. Um, so you, only you know what your, what your top skills are, but um, uh, whatever's gonna get you seen and, and something on film is the, is the quickest way to go. That's great. Well, fellow panelists, I think we got to wrap it up so CTN can move on to the next event. But I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Yvette and Sakari and Chrissy and Shannon, who would have been here if she could be here, uh, for your time, not only here today, but like sharing as much as you did for, for our documentary. And we appreciate that. And we will share that with the greater world somehow at some point. But like we said, beyondincubate.com is a place to stay in touch with all of that. Um, and in the meantime, I also want to say thank you to Tina, Tina Price, amazing that you and your team were able to pivot. Yes, applause for sure. You were able to make CTN still happen and bring our community together in an amazing way once again. Um, we have and to thank, thank you. Tony for being a good part of our. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 I, and I want to say to everybody that tuned in, awesome that you could be here and that you are doing that networking thing. You are doing that learning thing the best you can in pandemic times. I mean, that's awesome. So keep that up even when we get back to the real world being whatever that is when we come out of this. But uh, thank you everybody for joining us and we wish you all a happy and safe Thanksgiving. All right. Thank you, you too, everybody. Bye everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Bye.